Barry, uh, in uh, discussions between philosophers and neuroscientists, there's, uh, there's great debate. And I, what I like to do sometimes is to, to look at the extremes. Uh, and one extreme, which has been called neurophilosophy, is that everything in philosophy ultimately has to be understood in terms of the brain. There's nothing else. Everything else just doesn't exist. On the other hand, uh, the term has been called neuromania, which is that thinking that everything can be ter the, the, the explained in terms of the brain is also uh, a, a fallacy, uh, and that, uh, that it is the arrogation of brain scientists to think they can explain everything by the physical activities of the brain. So how do, how do we compare these two extremes? Can we learn anything from that? Well, we should be good Aristotelians and think it's the doctrine of the mean that's got to be somewhere in the middle. Now, uh, neurophilosophy, I don't like the term. I think there's neuroscience and philosophy collaborating with one another. The philosophers should still be philosophers. That's how they can contribute to the job of the neuroscientist to help understand the foundations and the fundamentals of the work. Equally, the neuroscientists should not be amateur philosophers. So I, I, I don't like, I like them collaborating. I don't like them fusing and merging. Mm. So I do think uh, there, there's, there's a danger. Equally, I think neuroscience is at its worst when it tries to be ultra-reductionist. In fact, some of the best neuroscience today is not reductionist. Cognitive neuroscience takes very seriously the fact that we're creatures with beliefs, desires, wants, wishes, and, and a range of complex experiences. It's not about to sweep that away, but it's trying to explain what might be going on underneath to give rise to that. And why does it appear to be the way it does? That's worth doing. Neuromania, of course, is the favorite label of people who want to point out some of the absurdities uh, that are appear in the press every now and then, sometimes from the mouths of neuroscientists, sometimes from the mouths of journalists reporting neuroscience. So, so we hear about neuro everything. And we hear uh, neuroscientists have shown us we've no free will. Neuroscientists have shown us um, that beauty is actually located. Neuroesthetics. In a, neuroesthetics is located in a particular part of the okay. cortex. And when that lights up, that's what it is. Here's the morality center and so on. Now, I do think one should not be attacking the claims of neuroscience at its weakest or at its loosest. As philosophers, we have an obligation to attack a position at its strongest. So you don't go after a straw man. What you should do is think of the very best cases that neuroscience uh, uh, offers as a way of explaining the mind, the self, uh, human understanding. And if you still find those wanting, now you're doing real work. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. If I look at the concept of neuromania, I could put this proposition to you. Either one or the other. Not an Aristotelian mean. One or the other. Either everything ultimately can be described in terms of brain processes, your cognitive systems. I mean, maybe, maybe it'll take hundreds of years or a thousand, but ultimately there's neuronal impulses and synaptic activity and what else is there? There's if the you, body. There's the body, e.g. Well, yeah, so, so but, we but that has to be fed back system. into the system. That's true. I mean, you have to have that feedback. Right. We have to have feedback. But notice, you're not going to understand an awful lot of the brain activity unless you correlate it with things going on in the environment. And but that has in to be body. coded into, into, into neuronal in, impulses. Indeed it has, but sometimes we let the world take the strain. We don't have to have internal representations of everything going on in the world. That would be too expensive. We make use of triggers and signals out there in the world that the brain resonates with or responds to, and we can allow the world to be an external representation for us. I mean, we, we, we've got this concept in philosophy of the extended mind. Mm -hmm. When you keep a diary, when you have uh, computer records, when you have your mobile phone, these are ways in which you, you've got external memory to keep track of things in the environment. They're not going on in your brain, but your brain is definitely making use of them. If we didn't have the brain, these would be meaningless uh, squiggles uh, and symbols. Sure. But, but it's, it's very obvious that we've got to think of the brain in its location. Brains are built by, uh, by genes, and genes are built by creatures in environments, biological creatures that occupy certain niches that are... Um, uh, subject to certain forces. Now you've got to put the whole thing together. So I think, you know, if neuroscience starts to aggregate the whole of science to itself, as it were, you know, becoming a neophysics, <laughs> then that's no good. But equally, physics doesn't give us the whole explanation of human beings. It might be that everything in the world is ultimately physical stuff, but there isn't just one theory of that stuff. 
Similarly, there isn't just one theory of what it is we do as human beings, but boy, neuroscience is very important as a component of the overall theory of mind, of extended mind, of culture, of language, of all the things that go together to make us uniquely human. Yeah, but when you have extended mind, whatever is in your diary, whatever is in the environment, is ultimately encoded in some signal that is in your brain. It's responded to, but we don't have perfect encoding. So, for example, let me give you an example of this. So, so, so when, when the visual system is calculating distance and depth in the environment from retinal disparity, it's, it's making certain assumptions. One of the assumptions is that objects are stable under rotation, that they don't yeah. change shape as you move them. Yeah. But there's no part of the brain where it's got that assumption written in. It functions well as long as it's in an environment in which objects are stable under rotation. If you took that brain to a different environment where they were not, vision wouldn't do the same job, it would break down. That's why you have visual illusions, fun houses at amusement Exactly parks. so, but it also shows you why some part of what we are calling the assumptions of the way things work are distributed jointly between the brain and the environment. It's a collaboration. It, which is an efficient way to, to operate. Absolutely. Let the world take the strain. And so what are the implications of that between the two extremes? Between the two extremes, then, I think uh, neuromania is attacking a straw man because anybody who thinks that neuroscience is going to give us the full explanation of the human condition and our location in the world and our dealing with the environment mm -hmm. is over-describing mm -hmm. their ambitions mm -hmm. and their case. But therefore, we don't need to worry about that. Neuroscience together with many other sciences and philosophy, I think are going to make real progress.